All right. Hi, I'm Michelle Porsche, and I am faculty here in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And welcome today for our talk with Dr. Sammy Schock on Black Disability Politics. Um, this uh, talk is uh, presented in collaboration between the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the Office of Disability Access and Inclusion. And um, I'm going to just say a few words before I hand it over to Dr. Lucy Agbu Obato, who was really the um, person who drove this program forward. Um, just to say a little bit about what we'll do today, um, we'll uh, have the talk, we'll have a QA um, moderated by Dr. Agbu Wobato. And we will also have a reception on the fourth floor terrace for those who are here in person. Um, and we're really appreciative for everyone who is joining us on Zoom. Um, please make sure to use uh, closed captioning if you need it or view transcript and you can use the Q&A function to uh, ask questions or, or provide comments. Um, before we start, I just wanted to read our UCSF land acknowledgement. Um, we would like to acknowledge the Ramatash Al Alone people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Ramatash Alone elders, past, present, and future, who called this place the land that UCSF sits upon, their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramitash Alone community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this wonderful discussion with our esteemed speaker, Dr. Sammy Schalk. Dr. Sammy Schalk is an associate professor of gender and women's studies at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She's the author of Body Minds Reimagined, Race, the Disability, Race and Gender in Black Women's Speculative Fiction, published by Duke in 2018 and the author of our book of discussion today, Black Disability Politics, which was published last year by Duke as well. Dr. Sammy Schalk's academic work focuses on race, disability, and gender in contemporary American literature and culture. She also writes for mainstream outlets, including a monthly column called Pleasure Practices in Tone Madison. She identifies as a fat, Black, queer, disabled femme, and a pleasure activist. As we embark on this conversation today, I ask you all to warmly welcome and join me in bringing Dr. Schalk to the UCSF stage. We are so honored to have your presence today for this conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here um, online and in person. So today I'm going to do a brief introduction to disability justice. Then I'll talk a little bit about the chapter that folks were invited to read um, for today. And then we'll go into some Q&A. So what is disability within disability justice? And this is a quote from Showing Up for Racial Justice, Disability Justice Caucus which reads, when we speak of disability, we are celebrating the brilliance and vitality of a vast community of peoples with non-normative bodies and minds, whether a disability is visible or not. This includes, though not limited to, folks who identify as disabled, chronically ill, deaf, mad, neurodivergent, and more. So within disability justice, when we talk about disabled people, we're not necessarily just referring to folks who are on social security disability benefits or those who receive formal accommodations. You are considered disabled if you say that you are part of the disability community. So disability justice as a term and a movement building framework was invented in 2005 by Patty Byrne, Leroy Moore, Mia Mingus, Eli Clare, and Sebastian Margaret. 
These are all disabled people who identify as Black, Asian, poor white, queer, and or trans activist. So these folks were sick of the disability rights movement, which we distinguish from the disability justice movement. Disability rights is the earlier movement that was focused on rights like the Americans with Disabilities Act and on basically state recognized rights. So these folks were sick of the disability rights movement being straight, right, and overly focused on the legal and civil rights and independent living frameworks. They were also tired of BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, progressive movements forgetting, in scare quotes, disability. So for me, this is very similar to the work of early Black feminist theorists, right, that we're talking about the, the way they were experiencing racism within the, the women's liberation movement and the way they were experiencing sexism within the Black liberation movement. Black feminists were saying, we have to deal with both of these things. These are not separable for us. And this is a similar impulse for the origins of disability justice. So another long quote here on the screen to explain a little bit more on what this framework is. Disability justice activists, organizers, and cultural workers understand that able-bodied supremacy has been formed in relation to other systems of domination and exploitation. The histories of white supremacy and ableism are inextricably entwined, created in the context of colonial conquest and capitalist domination. One cannot look at the history of U.S. slavery, the stealing of indigenous lands and U.S. imperialism without seeing the way that white supremacy uses ableism to create a lesser slash other group of people that is deemed less worthy, abled, smart, capable. A single issue, meaning just focus on disability, civil rights framework is not enough to explain the full extent of ableism and how it operates in society. We can only truly understand ableism by tracing its connections to heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, colonialism, and ableism. So this quote comes from Patty Byrne, one of the founders of Disability Justice and Sins Invalid, which is a disability uh, performance group based in the Bay Area written in June 2020. So this gives you a sense of what disability justice is. It's really an intersectional framework to understand that ableism is tied to all these other systems and that we can't actually dismantle other systems or ableism without addressing them all and their interconnections with one another. So often when folks talk about ableism, they have a pretty simple definition, meaning discrimination against disabled people or hatred for disabled people, potentially preference for or privileging non-disabled people. But I really like this definition from T.L. Lewis, um, who was a Black disabled organizer that I interviewed for the book. Um, T.L. developed this definition in community with other disabled and Black either or negatively racialized POC um, folks, especially Dustin Gibson. Um, their handles on Twitter are here in case you want to follow them. And Dustin was also a person that I interviewed for this book. They call it a working definition because it continually gets updated and adapted. And this is the last version that TL published in January of 2022. So this definition of ableism from a disability justice perspective reads, a system of assigning value to people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, and fitness. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in eugenics, anti-Blackness, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. This systemic oppression that leads to people and society determining people's value based on their culture, age, language, appearance, religion, birth or living place, health and wellness, and or their ability to satisfactorily reproduce, excel, and behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. And that's something that is underscored in the definition by it being italicized there, but I want to repeat it again. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. This is something that really came out in my research on this project, that Black folks generally in this country are interpreted as being outside of able-mindedness and able-bodiedness in all kinds of ways, and it justifies the treatment of all Black people, I'm thinking especially in the context of police violence, 
And so we don't have to be disabled. We have to be perceived as disabled. It's coming outside of these norms of productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, and fitness to be treated as disabled, to be treated and discriminated against through ableism. And so I'd like this definition because it emphasizes that in a way um, that makes it really clear why, for me, Black liberation needs to be thinking about disability much more strongly. So now I'll briefly go over the principles of disability justice. This again comes from the work of Sins Invalid um, from their disability justice primer, which uh, the image is on the screen. Um, you can find that online and download it. And these are the principles. Intersectionality, paying attention to the relationship between systems of oppression. Leadership of those most impacted. So those who are most impacted by an issue, meaning if we're talking about, for example, in New York, the proposed law of getting more folks off the street um, by putting more people in 72-hour holds, right? We expect that folks who are in the MAD and psych activist community, those who are homeless, those who are folks of color are going to be the ones that are leading because they are most impacted by this issue and they most know what's going on for folks living. This is also an anti-capitalist politic um, for, for many reasons, but disability in our culture is defined by inability to work, right? That's how we define it in terms of gaining access to certain kinds of state support. And so disability justice is anti-capitalist. It resists the idea that working is the most important and most valuable thing and working a certain number of hours. There's also cross-movement organizing, um, which should be kind of obvious here, but right, working with other kinds of movements outside of disability justice. Um, right now, there's a lot of work with reproductive justice movements and black liberation movements. Recognizing wholeness is another principle, meaning we recognize and believe that all people are whole as they are. People do not need to be fixed. If they choose to want to change something, that's okay, but there's not a desire to fix within disability justice. Sustainability, meaning that our work has to be sustainable, not just in the kind of green way that we might think of in terms of the, what we're using, but also for ourselves, preventing burnout, moving at the pace that makes sense for all of us, and not allowing folks to take on so much labor that they can't actually take care of themselves anymore. So we want sustainable movement building. Seven is cross-disability solidarity. Historically, in the disability rights movement, there's been a real emphasis on folks with either physical disabilities or sensory disabilities, and not so much with folks who have psych or developmental disabilities, um, chronic illness. And so disability justice says, no, all of us are a part of this community, and we want cross-disability solidarity and resist the disability hierarchy that exists in our culture. H is interdependence, the belief that we are all dependent on other people to function. None of us grow and make all of our own food, all of our clothes. We didn't like make the cars that we drive. We are all dependent on other people in all kinds of ways. But for folk, for disabled people, often that's really highlighted because the support we're getting is very intimate. And so people try to distance that from intimate support versus the support of the people that we don't see as being somehow different. And so disability justice emphasizes we are all interdependent and this is a value. It's a value that we have and we want to sustain. Nine is collective access, meaning we move at the pace that we need to move to make sure that everyone has what they need to be here. So often in disability justice spaces, we slow down and, and try to figure out, okay, someone's having a migraine. How can we adjust the lighting here? Somebody else needs to take a bio break. Let's take a break and we'll figure out this other thing. We don't leave people behind simply because their access needs aren't being met right now. And finally, collective liberation, disability justice believes that None of us are free until all of us are free and that it requires us to do this work across movements. So these are the main principles of disability justice. So that's a little bit about disability justice. This is my book, Black Disability Politics. It's an open access book. So you can either go to that tiny URL or scan um, the QR code that's on the screen here to get access to the book where you can download the individual chapters. Um, I really encourage folks to share this, even if you can afford to buy a book, maybe somebody else you know can't or can use it in a reading group. Um, I paid Duke lots of money from my research funds to make this happen. So I really want folks to know that this is available to anyone because for me, um, having work that's so based in activist history and interviews with activists, I didn't want activists to not have access to the materials. 
So this is the chapter that folks were invited to read for today. Um, it's chapter two of the book. So the book as a whole looks at some history of Black organizing around issues of disability and the ways that this differs from the mainstream, predominantly white disability rights movement by identifying some common qualities. Um, and so I look at two different organizations, the Black Panther Party and the National Black Women's Health Project, as well as doing interviews with contemporary Black disabled activists. And between the historical chapters, there's also praxis interludes, which try to take some of the lessons of the failures of the work of previous orgs so that we can learn how to incorporate it into our work today and learn from those missteps. So this chapter, chapter two, Fighting Psychiatric Abuse is about the Black Panther Party and the Black disability politics of mental and carceral institutions. So they're fighting psychiatric abuse, pushing back on it. So in this work, um, this is in the 1970s, the Black Panther Party worked with other mental and psych disability activist groups to protest the return of psychosurgery, um, which I'm sure folks here are familiar with, maybe the more of the other audiences that I've had, um, but the most famous kind of infamous version of psychosurgery that people know is a lobotomy, but there are other forms of this. And there was an attempt to return to the use of psychosurgery um, in the 1970s. In particular, UCLA was proposing to develop an institute or a center to study psychosurgery. And even in the proposals, they specifically named wanting to work on urban populations, on hysterical women, on criminals, right? So very clearly who they were going to target with these experimental surgeries were going to be marginalized people. And so the BPP worked with other organizations that focused on groups that were going to be targeted to fight the funding for UCLA Center, which ultimately did not get developed because of their work to get the funding pulled. And, you know, once there's no funding, it's probably not going to happen. Within this work and what they publish inside of their, um, their newspaper, the BPP noted how mental and psych disability labels were being used to target Black men for institutionalization, incarceration, and forced medication. So for folks who don't know the history of the Black Panther Party, um, there was a big push from COINTELPRO, which is the counterintelligence program of the FBI, to disrupt the organization. At one point, the FBI named them as the biggest internal uh, terrorist threat to the country. And this was primarily a group of teens and 20-year-old Black men and women, right, would have considered the biggest threat to the internal security of the nation. And so the FBI purposely tried to disrupt the organization, arresting folks, um, putting in like moles to lie to people, to turn people against one another, as well as direct attacks on um, BPP organizational buildings. And so because of this, there were a lot of Black Panther members who were in prison, either long-term or short-term, who then witnessed what was happening inside of these institutions. They saw that Black men were being labeled as dangerous, as unstable, and then being put on strong levels of medication to keep them docile and controlled within the jail, within the prison. Some of the other things that I cite in this chapter are letters from someone, um, from a Black man in a psych institution in Chicago that he had been moved from the prison to this institution under the, with some, with the label of schizophrenia, which he claims he does not have and doesn't understand. And in his writing, he talks about the fact that folks are kept under such high levels of medication that when it comes time to advocate for themselves, they're not able to do that anymore. And that the time the folks were spending inside of the psych institution, separate from the prisons, were not going towards their sentencing. So people were being kept longer inside of institutions through these psych labels being placed onto Black men in particular, and people were being kept for indefinite periods of time. So we continue to see the legacy of race and racism in psychology and psych diagnoses um, through this work, but in the contemporary period. One of my favorite books for this, if folks aren't familiar, is Jonathan Metzl's This Protest Psychosis. Um, it's really an incredible book that goes through the history of schizophrenia um, within the DSM and the way that the diagnosis changed over time, going from being something that was mostly considered to be a white housewife disease is something that was directly associated with Black men and Black men who were protesting for civil rights. 
So when black men would say something like the pigs are out to get me or the man's out to get me, it would be used to say that someone is hallucinating or that they're not experiencing reality. And so more and more folks were getting this diagnosis and put on these high level drugs as a result. So this is the last point here um, to open it up to conversation with you all. But my question is, how does race and unconscious bias impact how behaviors are interpreted for diagnosis and treatment, as well as the kind of care or the lack of care that people receive? And so the example that I'm going to give comes from a story that a friend told me. Um, and so there was a nurse working in um, a psych ward and was talking, was dealing with a woman who was on a 72 hour hold, a black woman. And she came to the nurse's station where a black nurse was working. And she said that this woman was self-harming and that she wanted to increase the medication for this woman because she was hitting herself, self-harming. And the black nurse was like, I don't, you know, that didn't seem to be what was happening when I had done her intake. So I'm going to check on her. And she goes to check on this woman and the woman is in her, in her room and she is hitting her head because she has braids. And that's how you scratch your hair. If you don't know when you have braids. And so this is an example of this small cultural nuance, right? That could have gotten someone an increasing level of medication, potentially unable to advocate for themselves to get out, extending the hold simply because they were scratching their head in a way that this person didn't recognize, right? So I use this example because it's such a tiny thing, a tiny misrecognition of a behavior that because someone is already in a space where they're being read as crazy, as uncontrolled, as unstable, all of their behaviors then are read through this lens rather than an attempt to try to understand a different lens that might be there. In this case, a very racialized lens. So I encourage you in your work and in your learning here to think about what are the ways these other smaller unconscious biases, things that folks might not even realize are happening, can occur when we're dealing with folks of color within the psychiatric medical industrial complex. And that's all for me. Thank you so much for that. And I really, your last example has me thinking about a lot. And before I dive into what I would like to ask you about, we do have a number of people who are here live. And I wanted to offer, you know, the room if there was some, you know, pressing inquiries or reflections that folks here may want to share to start us off with. And then maybe we can go into a more directed conversation. Any um, hands up? Or okay. And also, if there's questions online, to please let us know. We can also start with that. Yeah. And okay, so we have one question online here um, for you, Dr. Shock. Do you subscribe to discrit critical theory related to the school to prison pipeline, which might result in black males being over medicated in carceral mental health institutions? And what do you think are the opportunities for cross-movement solidarity in the health, mental health systems and other relevant disability movements? Or stated differently, what can doctors and other clinicians do to successfully partner in a supportive way to achieve social justice and necessary patient care? That's a very question and a big question. Um, absolutely. So discrete, um, it comes out of primarily the educational environment, which is talking about the school to prison pipeline, which is not just for black men, but we know also for black girls and, and children of color in general are more likely to be targeted and receive labels um, within the school system. One of the things that I learned from one of my graduate students doing some research is that there are labels within the school system that actually don't require any kind of outside diagnosis. It can be put on by, um, a, or by a teacher or by an aide to say that this student needs an IEP, um, an individual education plan. But some of these labels are things like, um, it's like dis, basically like disruptive behavior disorder. Like they're not behaving in the classroom and they're getting given these hmm, conduct disorder. Thank you. So I think this is one thing to start working on, right? Is that there needs to actually be conversation between um, mental health professionals and doctors with the schools 
to get folks access, because I do know that it can be hard to get a label. If there is something going on, it can be hard to get access to care for a lot of people, but to replace that with folks with no medical or psychiatric background being like, this person isn't behaving. So therefore we're just going to put this label on them that tracks them um, is terrible. And it, doesn't actually help folks. It doesn't give them the access to the tools that they need as if they actually received a diagnosis that said, okay, you have ADHD and here are some tools that we know can be helpful for folks versus you have dyslexia and here are tools that we know can be useful. There are different tools and there are different reasons why someone might be acting out in class. So more support and, and collaboration in that regard, I think would be really important. Um, and then I also think working with schools to get POPs out of schools. We know that students with disabilities, students of color with disabilities are most likely to be literally physically pulled out to be sent to um, not a principal who dealt with by a school police officer, a school resource officer. And it's more likely to cause harm, more likely to then again, get them into a criminal justice system with a label and to cause physical harm, pulling them out of class. Um, we had an example in Madison where a fourth grader was pulled out of class by a school resource officer and he had her by the hair and actually ripped out some of her braids. A fourth grader and an adult man, which that just makes no sense, right? So again, these labels are being put on folks, on folks of color, disabled students of color, and they're labeled as dangerous and it allows people to respond to them in this dangerous way. So I think there needs to be more collaboration and education across these groups to make sure that teachers know that this is not the way that we respond and actually get support and getting proper diagnoses for people um, or no diagnosis at all, right? Maybe it is because someone is just dealing with a lot of stuff at home and there is no disability diagnosis and that's okay we need to be able to make those distinctions and that requires actual long-term support as opposed to someone in the school deciding to put a label because they don't fit in any other category. I'd like to just, you know, reflect on that. You know, one of the things that we know happens is that the way that someone presents, right, it's misconstrued based on the lens of the person they're looking at, like that's, that's looking at them. So sometimes teachers and other even healthcare professionals, right? When we encounter people of color, we have our own view of what is happening. Like the braid analogy stands out to me, right? How certain actions can then just suddenly lead to down the stream of like, you know, bringing, you know, cops involved, things that we don't actually think about. Like when I was a resident, I remember a young man being put in uh, coercive like restraints for several weeks on end because he was seen as being verbally assaultive or aggressive towards people. But it was just his sheer presence led to people being so fearful of him that they could not, even when he was asleep, he was kept on physical restraints. And so a lot of what you, know, you shared in your book, we are experiencing currently in today's world. And a lot of times I feel like when I talk to psychiatrists, there's a certain helplessness that we have about how do we actually change the system? How, what do we do to actually intervene when we feel in our heart that this is wrong, but then we feel like we're operating a system that's outside of our control. Do you have some thoughts about how people can actually act, you know, like, you know, advocate to change what they are seeing as coercive, as, you know, unjust practices in our care? Yeah. I think one is speaking up. I know that that can be really hard and really scary for folks who are students or residents who feel like they can't speak up against someone who's over them in some way. But I think that it is essential to speak up to say, I think there might be something else going on here, right? To use the power that you have within the space that you have. None of us have the power to completely dismantle this system, right? Nothing that's happening within psychiatry is separate from what's happening in the outside world. It's not separate from lack of support for people with COVID. It is not lack, it's not separate from lack of affordable housing. Like all of these things are connected. So I think taking a whole picture approach to people and encouraging that to really know people's larger context can be really important. But then being involved in outside activism, if you're only going to work right here, it's only going to help right 
here, but the folks that you're working with need help outside of that. So the more that you can be involved in other kinds of outside activism, organizing, speaking up, it's really important. Um, and I think especially as folks with advanced degrees, like if you have the doctor in front of your name, there's a way that people just listen to you different, respect you differently. So it carries some weight and some power that I think is can be used for good. So really speaking up, um, making those changes and just seeing where are the places that you can work without breaking laws, right? But like, what are the places where there can be change? Um, T.L. Lewis in the book, and one of the quotes um, I have from T.L. talks about in this system that is so large and so overwhelming and so long, we have to remember that every single thing we do to make positive change matters. And they have this list, um, TL works within the prison industrial complex specifically um, with deaf folks who are incarcerated to make sure that they have access to the things that they need. Um, and so TL talks about like, how many families have you reunited? How many people have you given more joy, more ease? So I also think it's important to not lose, uh, lose sense of the individual people that you're helping because sometimes, yeah, you're not going to be able to save everyone. That's just not how it's going to work. But really holding on to, I can make a difference in these ways for this person. And that matters and that's valuable. Even as you're trying to make that systemic larger change is also important. If you can make a difference for a single person and make sure that they're not given a label that's inappropriate or institutionalized for even longer than they need to or put in restraints, right? If you can help with just that, it's going to make a difference for people. And so I encourage folks to also just hold on to that when you're working within such a big, intense system. Thank you for that. And I think it really, it's so important for us to hear this in healthcare and in medicine, because for so long, traditionally, there's been this narrative of neutrality as physicians, as doctors, right? We're supposed to take a neutral stance. And I love that this chapter actually started with, you know, Steiner's, you know, principles of radical psychiatry. And you have a quote that I want to share with people. And it says that psychiatry is a political activity because the psychiatrist has an influence in the power arrangements of the relationships in which he intervenes. I thought that was really notable because there is a growing activism or advocacy in, in healthcare, but it's still not as, you know, widespread or as entrenched as one might think. We're in a very traditional world in which we're told, like, you be neutral, but neutrality, as we know, is its own stance. You are actually agreeing and acquiescing to the status quo by being neutral. And I love you empowering us to feel like, actually, we have to do something and there isn't that we can do despite being taught and, you know, really trained to be in this middle. But is that really a middle or just part of what's actually the harm that's being done? Yeah, I think being neutral, denying the real systems that are harming people is doing more harm, right? That is gaslighting your patients in some way. Um, there's a book that a lot of folks in disability studies talk about called Willow Weep for Me. It's about Black women's journey with depression. And in one of the stories she writes about, her first um, attempt to find a therapist was with a Black man. And she was talking about being followed in a store as a Black woman when she had picked something up and how upsetting that was for her and how she felt stared at and all these things. And he like questioned that it was just something that she was in her mind, right? Um, that she was making a big deal out of nothing. And when you have those experiences denied, right, that's going to put somebody off of seeking care, of being honest, right, and also make them question their sense of reality when they know what's happening. But this person with a degree and with the expertise is telling them, well, maybe not, maybe not, right? So it does, it really matters to pay attention to the larger context that people are in and to not remain neutral, to not take someone outside of the context that they exist in. Like a black woman might get followed at a store and that is a real thing that could happen. And to question that is to question one's own sanity when someone is coming to get help with their mental health, that is not helpful, right? So yeah, I think there, there cannot be neutrality in the way we deal with folks' mental well-being in a deeply unjust world. Yeah, and I think, you know, it really speaks to the importance of diversity, right, of experiences of background in our healthcare system. You know, many of you may have seen that study that just came out this week about how literally the presence of Black providers in a county leads to prolonged life and health, better health outcome. 
right? So when we talk about how we change what the healthcare system looks like, we know it actually saves lives and it changes how people are able to get equitable care. In my role in the department, I'm one of the associate program directors and we train 64 brilliant, thoughtful, you know, psychiatry residents who are really passionate about these issues. And one thing I would love to hear from you is how do we change our training, our education system to really catch up to this justice component, to this idea of centering, you know, blackness in our work and also trying to, you know, invoke um, a, an advocacy, you know, lens in what we do in our practices? I think it involves reading outside of medical journals <laughs> and like reading more expansively, like including education that is from humanities perspectives and historical perspectives that give folks a sense of the system that they're working within and the history of it to understand that it is not neutral and that it did not just appear out of some like magical all-knowing godhead like this came from people and it has a history i think that's really important so that folks can hold that critical lens like at the end of the day i think those critical thinking skills those social critical thinking skills not just in terms of like critical thinking within the body and the systems right um i think that makes a real difference so that sort of training that says let's develop our critical thinking skills let's develop our social awareness skills as just as important as these other things um i think that that's one of the ways we change uh this education system i know there are some students of mine that are applying for med school and they're saying more med schools want them to have like a writing class and a humanities class to show that they've done other things and i think that there are ways that not just showing it, but then also incorporating that into the continued training, not just, hey, you took a writing class once, awesome, you're done, you never have to write something again. <laughs> Talk about history, right? How important it is for us to know our history. And in psychiatry as a specialty, we have a really, really harmful and oppressive history that has led to a lot of mistrust in how Black people, specifically talking about your book, engage with the mental health system, you know, and we struggle with how, how do we build, how do we rebuild trust from people who have been harmed by us and who may continue to be harmed by their interactions with us? Any reflections on that? I think it takes intentional community building. Um, when I think about in the National Black Women's Health Project is one of the orgs that I write about and their, their work with HIV AIDS, one of the things that they did was they went and talked to beauty shop folks like beauticians and barbers and hairstylists and they educated them about HIV. And then they made sure that those folks had materials in their shops, right? So you're going to spend a lot of time when you're in the hair, you know, getting your hair done. So you're there for a while and you're having these conversations and the what I'm taking from this, the reason I'm saying this is because I think it takes finding the stakeholders and communities that people trust. Because if you just come into a community that you are not a part of, no one is going to trust you, right? So you can build your individual connections, but also connecting to the stakeholders, to community leaders, and helping them understand so that they can disseminate that information in a way that might not come out of your mouth in the same way or be received, even if it's the same words, will be received differently from someone that folks connect to. So how can an institution, um, you know, a hospital connect with stakeholders, leaders inside of the communities you're trying to access and gain trust with um, in a non-extractive way, right? Not just to go study people, but to actually offer resources and resources that are developed in conversation with the community. It's another thing that the National Black Women's Health Project did is they would do these groups to ask Black women with HIV and AIDS, what are the things that are hard for you? What are the things that you care about? What are the things that you need? Rather than just saying, here's condoms, use condoms, the end, actually asking folks, what do you need to change certain behaviors in your community? And they were able to get that information. And some of that was, yeah, more support within our community because there's such lack of knowledge of how it gets transmitted. Um, and another thing that they found was that they wanted more education specifically for nurses, the people who spend the most time with them, because those were the folks that they were experiencing the most kind of discrimination within their medical settings, more so than the doctors, but they had less time with the doctors. So the organization also tried to figure out how do we educate nurses who are not getting maybe the same kind of development, 
professional development activities as the doctors are getting. So really talking to people in the community and especially stakeholders, leaders, I think are some of the ways that we build trust and, and create programming, create opportunities that people actually want rather than what we think they want and we're handing to them. Uh, and, oh, sorry. I, I had a couple more questions. And one of them you, saw, you alluded to early on in your talk around our carceral involvement in mental health. And this is something that has been, you know, an ongoing, especially in our program, recent discussions, how we engage with police, right? In our hospitals, in our psychiatric wards, and that tension between giving care and healing and having this presence of police force, especially knowing what the police represents for people of color, for black people, especially. Um, and I don't have a specific question about this. It's more or less like what, like maybe perhaps what can we think about doing in terms of really breaking what is a really entrenched and very complicated dynamic of who the police is there to protect and what is their role there? And how can we reimagine a world in which our healing spaces can feel more healing for people? I mean, I'm very much of the mentality that cops do not allow for healing. They are not, you know, not create more safety um, for most of us. Um, I know in some cities, folks are starting to develop um, mental health like calls so that people don't have to call the police in, in times of mental health crises because so many people are injured or killed as a result of that. But within um, psychiatric spaces, I think very limited contact, right? Like very limited presence, because I think for a lot of folks, I mean, even for me, it makes me uncomfortable, right? It makes me feel like I have to be on guard, that I'm being watched in a way that changes my behavior. And so I think if you're someone who's experiencing paranoia, for example, that's going to be ratcheted up if then there's a cop outside the door, which is going to change the way you speak, disclose, all kinds of things. So limiting as much as possible, like where folks are um, in contact with police as much as possible, if not eliminating from spaces that that is viable, I think is an important first step because they do not have any training in how to handle folks um, other than violence, right? To return violence. And that's not helping or healing anybody to experience violence. So how do we reduce their presence as much as possible? How do we build other systems of safety that doesn't involve violence towards folks? Um, and I don't have those answers, right? I don't work within these systems, but trying to figure out in a system, in a world that says police are the answer to all of our problems, um, how can we just start to pull it back? Where can we just reduce it? Um, can we have folks just not visible, not right there, on call somewhere else so that they're not hovering around people in the same way. Um, I think those are first steps of just how can we reduce the contact, even if we're not at a point of being able to fully eliminate, and how do we train more folks to have the skills to de-escalate without the first response being, I'm going to call the cops. I have one last question, um, and that is really on sustainability, right? You mentioned that we have, this is a long game. And how do you build sustainability into your life, into your work? And what lessons can we learn from that as we try to really fight against oppressive systems and not burn out and to last and to be able to stay the long haul? Well, we mentioned in my uh, bio that I identify as a pleasure activist. So I encourage folks to read Adrienne Marie Brown's book, Pleasure Activism, um, which basically asserts that pleasure is political, who perceives pleasure versus whose pleasure is criminalized, policed, shamed, um, negated in all these ways is a political issue. And for me, that has meant trying to embrace my pleasure more in all spaces, including in my teaching work. So, you know, I wear clothes that make me feel good and I express myself in ways that just are pleasurable to me so that no matter what I'm doing, I'm trying to center pleasure and remind other people that their pleasure matters. And I think that's one of the ways that I keep going is I find the joy, um, even in the midst of really hard things. Um, going back to that T.L. Lewis, right? Um, in 2020, in the uprisings, one of the things that I did in Madison was 
distribute food and water at protests. That was the thing that I could do without having to be in the streets because if we have to run from the cops, I'm screwed. So <laughs> we're not doing that. Um, and I really held on to those moments where people were so grateful to have water. We're so grateful, like, oh, thank God somebody has something. I didn't realize we were going to be out this long or whatever. And I held on to those moments of, of connection and pleasure giving and pleasure sharing. So that's another way that that's something that really helps sustain me. And then also remaining in connection with folks who are younger than me and coming up because I want to be held accountable for the ways that I'm like not as connected to lived realities in some ways. Like I have much more privilege now that I make more money now that I have these degrees. And that's another way that I feel like I'm tapped into what's going on for folks and I'm being held accountable and recognizing the things that I'm not seeing anymore. Um, and that feels sustainable for me because otherwise I think I'll be disconnected. So staying connected and actually listening and building relationships with younger folks who feel like they can say something to me too <laughs> is really important. But yeah, pleasure, staying connected to people who are um, not of my generation necessarily are ways that help me sustain in this work and just really holding on to the good things that have happened and remembering that I can make those things happen again. For that. Absolutely. And next applause. And anybody else before I jump in? Um, so I had a question about your, uh, just asking about your research process, who you talk to about, you know, curious about your funding support and your institutional support to be an activist scholar, because I think it's a model for all of us here. So I just would love to hear more about that. Yeah. So, um, well, research wise, this project came from, I read a book um, called Body and Soul by Alondra Nelson, which is about the Black Panthers health activism. And I read it because somebody recommended it. And there was a quote in the book that mentioned, or the quoted Irving Zola, who's one of the early founders of disability rights or disability studies. And it like, was one of those light bulb moments. I don't know. I, I have these moments in like the course of my life where it just like something changes. And it was the first time that I really thought about health activism as potentially disability justice work and that health activism might be the way to find more um, disability political work by folks of color. Um, because that was something that I'm really invested in is showing that we have been doing this work for a long time as folks of color. It just might not look the same. And so I ended up going into the archive and mostly reading their publications. And I just found so much that it started to become more than just like the one chapter that I thought it was going to be. Um, so in some ways, the, the historical trajectory of this project was accidental. I went into the archives and there just was so much. And I wrote so much and I realized, okay, this is its own book, not this other kind of more um, humanities and literature project that I originally thought it was going to be. And in terms of funding, um, I, I work for a public institution that, so University of Wisconsin has something called the Wisconsin Idea, which is one of their kind of value mission statements, which essentially says that the work of the university should benefit the people of the state and beyond. And folks well before me at Wisconsin, um, and now my as well, we've used that to say, well, public intellectual work and activist work is part of that then. Right. If you want the work of the institution to benefit the people of the state, then my research about activism and doing activism is part of that. So I'm lucky to work somewhere that that's kind of worked into our institution. So mostly I've had internal funding from my institution to do this research. Um, it helps that my research is not super expensive. You know, looking at going to an archive, reading a bunch of things, interviewing a couple of folks is not super expensive. But right now, my funding for it has been almost exclusively internal to my institution because of this Wisconsin idea that supports work that, again, is directly benefiting people of the state and beyond and that is doing the public intellectual sharing. That's how I was able to make the book open access was using research funds. Um, so I just am lucky to work in a place where that's what it is. Um, as I move into my next research project, I'll be going back to <laughs> more external funding options, but I was able to finish this book with that kind of support. 
In addition, I also had a postdoc at Rutgers um, that gave me time and just the time to do the work um, with some support. And so between those two things, I was able to finish the project. But for me, um, it's the only way to do this work. I don't think I could be a part of the academy and not feel and feel like it's the only thing I'm doing. I have to feel like I have ties outside of it that I have a foot outside of it because it's a space that wasn't made for me. It wasn't made for people like me. I still am often, you know, the only black person or the only queer person or the only disabled person in a room. And it's a really lonely place. And so when I go into my community and I'm doing activist stuff, I'm not the only one. I'm never the only one. And that for me, it's another aspect of that sustainability. It's the only way I could do it. And I don't know that I could work somewhere that didn't support it. Um, you know, I never thought I would be an academic. I thought I would be working in nonprofits by now, um, but it's continued to work out. And I do love research and writing, so I'm glad. Um, but yeah, it's been a coincidence of working somewhere that really does value public intellectual work and public engagement work and community engagement um, that I don't know all institutions value. That's really inspiring. And I hope that other places take notes and think about how to reimagine, you know, their funding resources and what they prioritize uh, by their fiscal budgets. Follow the money, right? Yeah, but this has been such a wonderful conversation. I feel like we can go on and on and on but we do have a reception and we'd love to continue the socialization there. But just wanted to just thank you again for your time, for your energy, for your spirit today. And we hope this is the beginning of an ongoing relationship with you moving forward. I love that. Thank you all so much for being here in person and online. <laughs> thank you all.